three years ago, me and Jen were taking a lot of classes. Um, classes on welding, classes on surfing, classes on shoemaking, literally anything that we could get our hands on. Um, things that we had always kind of wanted to learn or were curious about, but had never actually had an opportunity to learn. The thing was, these classes weren't really for us. For example, in my shoemaking class, I was surrounded by people who wanted to work for Nike or Colon or Steve Madden, but we were just sort of intellectual tourists in a world that wasn't our own. So we were spending hundreds of dollars and weeks of our time on these classes where all we got out of it was sating our curiosity. And unfortunately, that makes you pretty broke pretty quickly. Um, so we ended up founding the brain. And so what the brainery is, is you have people from all walks of life, from PhD students, uh, hobbyists, enthusiasts, sometimes lecturers, real teachers, anyone can come and teach a class about things that they are passionate about. And at first we thought, this is never gonna work out. This is just gonna be like a book club. It's gonna be us, you know, 20 other people, maybe sitting in a room, not doing any work. Uh, but very quickly, it turned into something real, and now we've had over a thousand classes, we've pushed over 15,000 students through classes and had hundreds of teachers. So someone kind of hinted at the beginning, it was kind of like a book club. We structured everything really collaboratively. So uh, we would assign homework. We had a class about meat, and you would have to research how chickens were raised, and I would research pork chops. And then the idea was that we would all go home, research on the internet, come back to class and sort of share these things together. It is a great theory and we really thought it was gonna work, but then it turns out life kind of gets in the way. And when we're, you know, you end up having to cook dinner or work late, and then the next thing you know, you're sort of on the way to class with like a Wikipedia article and you're just kind of reading things right before you get there. So, um, in a couple of these situations though, things really worked out for us. Uh, I led a class on weather. And it turned out that half of the class was sci were scientists, and some of them were retired, and some of them were just finishing their PhD, and they were all really into it, and they dug up all this great research. So the bells kind of went off after that, when we were like, well, clearly we can just throw a rock and find enthusiasts and experts on just about any subject, like weather, um, within New York City. So we might as well tap into that community and have them in our classes. Yeah, so for example, I, I taught a class about fragrance because one of the things that got us into starting the brain right was I went to FIT, I was taking my shoemaking classes there, and I said, hey, I want to take this class about fragrance. And they looked at me and they said, no, you don't have a BA in perfume, so we're not going to let you into this class. And I'm like, look, I'm here, I'm trying to give you hundreds of dollars, just take it and teach me this stuff. And they're like, no, sorry, you don't have the credentials to do it. And my first reaction to that was, I could just learn all of this stuff on the internet. Like, there's no reason for me to give you all this money. Why wouldn't you just take my money? And then my second response was, why the hell am I trying to give you money when we could just all learn these in an informal environment? So when I had my, my fragrance class, where I finally got all these people together and forced them to do research with me, um, we had someone who worked in the perfume industry, we had a bartender who actually was a sniffer for liquor companies. So it was like we had people from all ends of the spectrum. So as Jen said, you can find experts on pretty much anything uh, in New York and Brooklyn. The hardest thing about it is convincing people that they have the ability to teach. Because even if you know about something, you have a hobby, you run home from work every day and you work so hard on these little projects, you never think that anyone else is interested. But the thing is, it's not true at all. Um, you will find people who love donuts, like people who love Emily Dickinson. Um, we've sold out classes on like four weeks on beekeeping. Uh, we've had creative writing about pi, uh, like pi the food, not the number. <laughs> but we probably could do the number too. Um, the thing is, like everyone is interested in everything, and you just have to give them uh, an avenue to pursue that. And so when you're looking at yourself and you think, I'm not credentialed to teach these things, the thing is you are, because what you are is you're passionate about it and you're interested in it. And the thing that you need in order to communicate information to someone isn't some sort of list of, you know, I went to school here, I took this class, I'm now able to teach this. What you need is an ability to connect with the people who you're talking to.
And what we found is that amateurs, um, they, you're on the same level as them. So when I take a class about beekeeping, say, and you have someone who didn't go to beekeeping university teach you in class, the instructor is still excited about the same sorts of things that you're excited about when you're just getting into the topic. So we've all had instructors where they know everything, they're incredibly credentialed, you know, they're, they're sitting up on high teaching you, but as soon as you walk out of that classroom, you don't remember a thing that they told you, and it's because they don't have that sort of passion that ends up being contagious to you as a learner. And so we like to think of ourselves as a jumping off point for trying something new. Uh, and it's kind of the background we come from where we're just curious about a lot of different things. And one of the problems that we were running into, as someone kind of discussed, is that it, it's a real challenge to sometimes start a new hobby. So if you want to learn to brew beer, you have to go out and get the buckets and the sanitizer and the bottling equipment. And that's before you even get to the grains to make your beer. So it can be a, an investment of money, or often it can be an investment of time. And that's really before you figure out whether or not you like this thing. So what we want to do is kind of remove that barrier for people. Um, if you're interested in learning about perfume, we want you to be able to come to a one or two week class, uh, experiment mixing and blending things with an expert who knows, has done this a million times, alongside a whole bunch of other people who are also interested in this, and then with all the tools provided for you. Then you can say, hey, I love this, I'm gonna go get my little kit and do it all myself, or I'm gonna, uh, this isn't for me, but hopefully you've learned something along the way. I think one of our big buzzwords at the Brainery is accessibility. And when we first started off, we were thinking of accessibility in terms of money. Because we had been spending hundreds of dollars, we were going to broke, learning extracurricular things. And all of our classes were $25 and four weeks long. So they're meeting once a week, so it's not a million days, but still. Um, so the price was right, but what we found is that people in New York are very, very busy. They don't have all the time in the world to come to the same place every Tuesday night and take a class. Like, I don't even know what I'm doing two days from now. How am I able to plan a whole month ahead? So what it ended up becoming after that was like just said, one or two session classes where instead of simply being accessible in terms of price, we're also accessible in terms of fitting into your life. Because we are all busy and we do have all of these things we're spending all of our time doing. And we don't want people to have to live their lives around the brain, right? We want the brain to kind of inject itself into their lives. And one of the things that we really try to do is just sort of engage curiosity. So, and, you know, we're all programmed to be really curious about the world around us. And sometimes, I found many times over the past three years, I didn't even know that I wanted to learn something until we had a class about it. And then it was presented in front of me. Um, for example, we had these great tree identification walks uh, last fall, and now I find myself going to the botanical garden and uh, like trying to identify every tree I, tree I see on the street, and it's become this this passion of mine. And six months ago, I could care could have cared less about what tree was out front. Um, and so, by giving people sort of a plethora of things to choose from, like. Patrick said everything from zombie makeup to the history of the New York City subway. We're really trying to just lower the barrier altogether and be like, if you can learn about six different things this week here if you want, and you know, then you choose which ones you want to pursue. I think another barrier to entry in getting onto the topic is some sort of intimidation to you are not worthy to take a sort of class. Because there are a lot of other organizations in New York um, that do education on everything from electronics to food and everything. But you think to yourself, if I go to this food class, are they going to make fun of me because I don't know what braising is? Or if I go to this electronics class, maybe I'm not very good at, at soldering and people are, it's going to slow down the class and it's going to be awkward. Granted, that's probably just you being an idiot because everyone loves sharing everything else. But what we try to do with the brain ring is have that very wide breadth of you know, zombie makeup and beekeeping and Emily Dickinson and everything to kind of make it be more accessible emotionally to people. So that you can look at it and say, hey, we, we are built you know, to be curious as human beings. I need to be curious outside of you know, my workplace and going home afterwards. Because we're, we're here because of the education system that exists in America. And we have been going to school, you know, we go to school for at least 12 years, where every single day, all we do, seven hours a day, is learn. Granted, we might 
playing the whole time that you're there, but you're still learning. And eventually, once you kind of graduate out of that system, you're dropped into the working world. Where what you do, you go to work, and then maybe you go home, and then maybe you go to sleep. And the next day you do the whole thing again, and you're kind of missing out on that sort of mental stimulation and intellectual curiosity that even though it was thrown on you from an early age, um, it's still something that you you do miss, and it is something you've been trained to do that from a very young age that you suddenly expect you to give up just because you've grown up. Um, another sort of one of our main things is that these classes take place in real life. Uh, everyone comes to the brewery, and we have a storefront, and that is where everything takes place. So we're not on, we, we're online, but the classes are not online. Um, they are not internet-based, and for us, the sort of social aspect is a huge part of it. And even if it's people are just coming to classes instead of going to a bar at night, uh, we, you know, there is that person-to-person that -person simulation, and that's really what we're going for. I think that the internet is great for a lot of things. Um, I have this idea of outward-facing education versus inward-facing education, where when you're going to school uh, for, you know, the 12 years of your life that you're, you're going to compulsory education. Um, it's outward facing education. You're going there for grades, you're going there so you can train for a job, you're going there uh, you know, so you can please your parents or get, do well on a, on a test. But later, it turns out you have needs yourself and you have things that you need to learn in order to fulfill your curiosity as a human being. So you need to start turning that lens inward and saying, what can I do? To, to make myself fuller as a human being? What can I do to have education that educates me in terms of making me feel better as opposed to trying to go down a list of credentials? And I feel like that is really a big difference between some of the uh, like online education versus real life education, where the internet is fantastic for just going down a list of things and not having an emotional connection. You might get excited about something when you, you know, get random on Wikipedia a thousand times you know, burn your whole afternoon on there, but you don't have the same sort of contagious, passionate excitement that you do when you're interacting with a room full of other people who are really into, you know, what they're doing. Which brings us to something that's happening right now yeah. that we're not at because we're here talking to you. So uh, I think one of the things that's been most exciting for us is seeing how these types of informal schools have really multiplied over, you know, before we started and since we've started. So, I mean, within Brooklyn and New York, there are many, many different versions. There's a, a, a school that's entirely barter-based. Um, there is the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research, which is attempting to bring graduate-level seminars to, um, to bars and, and bookstores. And then there is today the Brooklyn School Share, which is happening down in Kiwanis, and it is a full day of learning. It is six blocks. You get to choose um, throughout the day what you want to attend, and it's it's free. You can give a donation if you want, and that was really inspirational for us. And so um, for, it's really exciting to sort of see this plethora of options. Everybody approaches it completely differently. Um, the people who attend are different for everything, and it's. It's really satisfying to just see adults going out and learning for the sake of learning. So whenever we have these sorts of discussions with people, I always ask you, what are you doing next? Like, how are you going to expand? You know, what is, what is your role in uh, taking informal education and community-based education to the masses? And to me, it's less about what we're doing and more connecting to all of those other groups out there that are doing their own thing. Um, there are people upstate, there are people in Melbourne, there are people in Seoul, all of these people we've communicated with and we've kind of helped them get things off of the ground that are, you know, their own children in terms of, you know, educational endeavors and it really gives them their own, uh, their own communities kind of, kind of brain. So it's not so much us spreading the brainery around, but rather helping other people and empowering them to do the same sorts of things themselves. Thank you. Thank you.